Sunday nights, we're, uh, I'm trying to cover a lot of territory. We've been in the book of Revelation for, I don't know, 55 or 60 weeks. Most people can't find enough in Revelation to sp- talk about for a night. Uh, somebody told me about a preacher that started preaching on Revelation, said he got to the fourth chapter and said, I don't understand this, so let's go back over here and talk about something over in the Gospels or something. Well, most people don't have any idea. I'm sure that what he talked about up to the fourth chapter, if he couldn't get anywhere in the fourth chapter, I'm sure he didn't understand the first, second, and third chapters. Uh, But we're talking about the end of time and the prophecies of the end of time. And right now we're particularly in the 20th chapter and the 21st chapter, and I'm tying together uh, Old Testament scriptures with the 20th chapter, uh, and, uh, with the 21st chapter, and I'm particularly talking about the uh, 11th chapter of, of Isaiah, if you want to go back over there with me. 11th chapter of Isaiah. Now, at the end of time, there's some things that are going to happen. At the end of time, the Gentile rule over the Jews in Jerusalem will cease. Now, no one's ruling the Jews now except the Jews. Uh, when the Bible says that, they'll, that the Jews will fall by the edge of the sword there in Luke 21, 24, and that they'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, I believe... Now, when somebody will come up to me, even people at Grace and Truth Ministries will say, well, it could be another 100 years or 200 years or 500 years before Jesus comes. No, it couldn't. The Gentile rule over the Jews and Jerusalem is consummated, particularly as of the Six-Day War of 1967. And then, of course, uh, the Israel became a nation for the first time, May 14th, 1948, in 2,600 years, since they were carried away captive by Nebuchadnezzar uh, in the 6th century B.C., 586 B.C., so when, it, when the Gentile rule over the Jews has ceased, Amos said that they will never be scattered to begin, that they will be here, uh, that Amos 9 and 14, that they'll be here for the consummation of all things. And when these things begin to come to pass, not when they've been happening for Uh, centuries. In fact, look at that. Look at Luke 21, because there's a verse there we need to read. Look at Luke 21. Luke 21, and particularly with the events of the last two weeks here in the world, in Luke 21, of course, 20 through 24 is talking about uh, Jerusalem being encamped by armies, and let those that are, this is the desolation of God, Well, Jerusalem has been encamped by armies for 2,600 years up until the Six-Day War, June 5th through June 10th of 1967. And they have not been a nation until May 14th, 1948. And when they came back as a nation, when they were split in 586, 586, well, 586 B.C., southern Israel, or Judah, was carried into captivity. And then northern Israel, in 722 B.C., northern Israel was carried into captivity. And then, of course, we know that they were split from being one nation. At one time, they were one nation, one nation, not one nation. Well, they were one nation under God. (laughs) Supposed to be one nation under God. Uh, in the Old Testament, isn't it amazing? Uh, there was no freedom of religion. If you didn't believe Jehovah God, you died. Uh, and there was no separation from church and state. The church was the state. Amazing, isn't it? And then uh, there were one nation. And then because of Solomon in First Kings the 11th chapter, where he allowed his wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines. That was a secondary wife. Uh, Now, Solomon wasn't real stupid. He didn't go out and get him a... Here he is, wisest man in the world. He didn't go out and get a thousand ugly women. 
Don't you believe that? He got a thousand wives, and a lot of these were very beautiful women. And when he writes, he, he wrote, the. it's believed, that he wrote the Song of Solomon when he was young. And then he wrote the Proverbs in his middle age. Middle age. And he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes when he became real experienced after he was old and mature. And he said concerning all the money that he had, he said it's all vanity and vexation of spirit, including all of these thousand women. And he said, I never have been able to fulfill all of my desires, and that includes sexual desires from a thousand women. He said, I cannot fulfill all my desires. It vexes my soul. And he had the riches like no man ever before him or after him for what there was to have in the world. He had everything. Gold, the temple's gold. Huh? I, think he's telling something. Yeah, I think he was telling us something. And Ecclesiastes is 12 chapters. You ought to go read that about once every year, year and a half. Read that, and it will make you just crawl down in a hole in the ground. Think, oh, man, if this is the way this man felt, uh, what is life going to be to me? Well, the kingdom split because Solomon, God said, I'll take the kingdom from you. And his son Rehoboam caused the split by taking some bad advice from his uh, teenage buddies. They said, these old men that come to you and tell you that your father chastised them with whips, tell them you're going to chastise them with scorpions. And that was a bloody beating with uh, probably the predecessor to the cat of nine tails. So Jeroboam, the people come to Jeroboam and tell him to... They tell Jeroboam... The ten northern tribes, northern tribes, and they are led by the tribe of Ephraim, who was the second born son of Joseph. So whenever you see, that's the ten tribes, whenever you see Ephraim referred to as a nation, or Joseph referred to as a nation, after the death of Ephraim and after the death of Joseph, you get on up into the prophets like Hosea and his prophesying against Ephraim. He's talking about the nation. So the nation referred to when it's referring to Ephraim would be the ten northern tribes. When it's referring to Joseph, like in the 37th chapter, Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, when the Bible says, take one stick for Judah, which was the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin comprised the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom was the ten tribes led by Ephraim, the second born of Joseph. Ephraim received the blessing that Joseph had as the ownership of Israel. So the kingdom was split. <laughs> well, northern Israel got involved. When Jeroboam comes in, he brings in golden calf worship. And then, of course, all along the way, these kings are worshiping Baal in the grove, and when you get down to 1 Kings, the 16th chapter, that's when Ahab brings in his wife's, his wife's father's gods, Baal in the grove, and make that the national god and goddess of northern Israel. And then, of course, when Ahab, uh, when, his, when he and Jezebel have a, have a daughter, her name, her name is... Uh, uh, Athaliah, and Athaliah, Ahab is running around with Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat is basically a good man, except for one thing. He's hanging around Ahab. Well, when, when Athaliah, when she uh, sees Jehoshaphat, who has a son whose name is Jehoram, she looks at him, Jehoram looks at her, and, and they get this thing for each other, and they marry each other. And Athaliah brings this system down into southern Judah, brings in the system of Baal and grove worship. 
And Baal in the grove was just Hercules and Venus, and it was all those male and female deities. So God gets fed up with northern Israel with their apostasy. He carries them into captivity. He carries them all into all the world. In all the world, southern Judah, when this same system bleeds down into southern Judah, then southern Judah is carried into all the world. And then at the end of time, and of course we know in Acts 2, in Acts 2, that these, that these Jews were given uh, in Deuteronomy, the book of the law, uh, particularly in, well not Deuteronomy, Exodus, the 23rd chapter, that they're given in the book of the law, laws that they have to come back to Jerusalem. So they all come back to Jerusalem for the three feasts, for Passover, Pentecost, and the end gathering, which is coupled with the Day of Atonement. And God brings together the Jews back into one, one people. And at the end of time, what God does, He keeps the, ethnic, the ethnicity of these people, their ethnic identity. And at the end of time, where all these people are scattered, they come back into one nation. They're no longer two nations. And that is what, that is what the 37th chapter of Ezekiel says. That there'll no longer be two nations. The Lord tells Ezekiel, take one stick for Joseph... One stick for Judah, put them together in my hand. One stick for Joseph. Now, when the Mormons read that, they say, take one stick for Joseph Smith. You knuckleheads. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Not Joseph Smith. Joseph, the second born son, uh, the 11th born son of Jacob. And his second, look at this. Let me just show you. How stupid they are. They don't even read it. Look at the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. I'll just show you something. I'm not going to cover the 37th chapter, but I'm going to show you something here. I, I haven't stopped to specifically point it out, but I may have said, said something to, to a degree, but I just want to show you how ignorant these people are. 37th chapter, uh, verse 15, The word of the Lord came in again to me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah. That's the southern kingdom. And the southern kingdom is Judah and Benjamin. Right? The ten tribes are led by Joseph. And in the 48th chapter of Genesis, Genesis 48, that's where we see Jacob. He comes to Egypt, after Joseph rises up in Egypt, second to Pharaoh, and when he comes to Egypt, <coughs> Jacob calls Joseph to bring his two sons to him, and he brings Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh is his eldest, and the eldest usually receive the hand of blessing. And when Joseph brings his two sons to him, he puts his left hand, Joseph puts his left hand, on the top of Manasseh and guides him to his father's right hand because that's the hand of authority. And once they bestow that blessing of ownership and inheritance upon one, it cannot be transferred. So Joseph presumes his father understands he's going to have to put his right hand upon Manasseh. Well, when Joseph gets close to him, J Jacob crosses his hands and that is very... Very important because that's where he crosses at his hand and puts the right hand of blessing or inheritance on the head of Ephraim. So anytime you see Ephraim referred to as a nation, that's because he received the blessing from Joseph. And Joseph got it from Jacob. And Jacob got it from Isaac. And Isaac got it from his father Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim. So when you see Ephraim, that's northern Israel, and it's Joseph. And notice the way it puts it here. Look here. And join them one to another into one stick. Well, I didn't finish reading that, did it? Well, look at verse 16. Excuse me. Moreover, thou son of man, take one stick and write upon it for Judah, for the children of Israel, his companions. And notice here in this next sentence. Then take another stick and write upon it, write upon it, 
for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. Not Joseph Smith, the stick of Ephraim. That's dumb. And the Mormons say, this is Joseph Smith. Well, not unless Ephraim was the son of Joseph Smith. Well, if, if he had some illegitimate son out there and he named him Ephraim, they'll probably say, that's for that. No. Ephraim, the second born of Joseph, Joseph, the eleventh born of Jacob, Joseph received the inheritance as the ownership, and now Ephraim receives it, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. So from the northern kingdom comes the inheritance, and from southern Judah comes the king. So without one, you can't have one without the other, can you? Huh? You can't have the kingdom with a king without the inheritance. So, look here. And join them one to another into one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand, Ephraim or Joseph and, and Judah. So, what he's saying, at the end of time, at the end of time, you'll have one nation. Not two like they used to be. And people will say, well, during the days of Jesus, they were one nation. No, they weren't. Northern Israel was not back from the captivity, were they? Only southern Judah received the four decrees to come back and rebuild the, the temple and rebuild the wall and these decrees were given by Persian kings, by Persian kings. Y'all remember the kings? Cyrus. And who else? Not, well, not Artaxerxes yet. That's, who was the second king that gave it? Darius. And then R-T-A-X. E-R-X-E-S. I always thought well, that was an interesting name. I told Mary I wanted to have a dog, a great big dog, and call him Artaxerxes. <laughs> Darius, and he called him Artie for short, I guess. I don't know. Artie, yeah, Artaxerxes. And then Artaxerxes gave the fourth decree, A-X-E-R-X-E-S. And, of course, the first decree was given, and all of this was given to southern Judah only. And the first decree was given by Cyrus uh, there in Ezra, the first chapter. In Ezra, the first chapter, and that was about the temple, going and rebuilding the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed in 586. And the second decree was given, given in Ezra, the sixth chapter, and that was about the temple. It was just a reaffirmation of the first decree. And Artaxerxes gave the third decree which was about, that was in Ezra, the seventh, seventh, the seventh chapter, and that was about temple sacrifices and priests, and then Artaxerxes gave the fourth decree, and that was uh, in Nehemiah, the second chapter. Second chapter, the first decree was uh, in 538. The second decree uh, was in 520 B.C., and the fourth decree was in 456 B.C. The third decree is in 456. And the fourth decree is in 444 B.C. And that, that fourth decree, that was the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. That's quoted in Daniel 9.25 concerning the 70 weeks of Daniel. Up until Messiah the Prince, that'll be 69 weeks, 483 years. I didn't mean to get in this. I'm sorry. Now let's get back to this up here. Now, during the days of Jesus, people will say, well, Israel was back then. No, northern Israel wasn't back. Only southern Judah was back. Southern Judah was back from the captivity. Not northern Israel. They're called the ten lost tribes. How could they have been back? What was here during the days of Jesus in northern Israel, you go north of the Mason-Dixon line, there in... We'll call it that. In Israel, you go north, that's called Samaria. And Samaria was considered 
a bunch of pagans, what the Pharisees considered them pagans, because they had intermarried with the Assyrians when they had come in there, and they had inter not only intermarried, but they had mixed their religion with the religion of the Assyrians. And that's why Jesus told the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, you worship, you know not what. But the time will come when you worship God in spirit and truth. Now, I'm bringing this out again because i got to do that to show you when God brings Israel back into one nation, they were not back during the days of Jesus. Only southern Judah was back from the captivity. They were the only ones given any decrees to come back. Now, that's exactly what I said that this 37th chapter was tied to uh, the... Let's go back over here to the uh, uh, 11th chapter of Isaiah. I want to show you how... Huh? Oh, I was going to show you Luke. Let me show you something in Luke. Let me show you something in Luke. Let me go, let's go back over to Luke, and then we'll go to the 11th chapter. Luke 21. Let me read this. And this is particularly of necessity right now. <clears throat> Verse 24, They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. That's the Jews. Now, being led away captive is not something just happened up to this time. Being led away captive has happened from 586 B.C. From 586 B.C. when southern Judah was carried to captivity until May 14, 1948. And particularly, when, you, when it says here, they'll be led away captive into all nations. And look at the next phrase. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. That's very important because he's talking about in southern Judah is Jerusalem. And they cease to be trodden down. And Jerusalem ceased to be trodden down of the Gentiles. If you'll notice... Look back at verse 20. When ye shall see not Israel encamped by armies, but Jerusalem campused with armies. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. When did Jerusalem cease, not only surrounded by armies, but treading through their streets? The, the Israelites throughout, or the Israelis, whatever you want to call them, they threw out the Jordanians in the Six-Day War of 1967, the first time since Nebuchadnezzar came in and trod through their streets 2,600 years ago. Since then, they have been, the armies have been walking through their streets, passing them from one nation to another. So when he says, in verse 24, Jerusalem shall be trodden down, of the unbelievers. Gentile means unbeliever. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And then he switches the thought. Because the whole idea of this chapter is what's going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world. And then he says, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, aporio, my, A-P-O-R-E-O, A-P-O-R-E-O-M-A-I. -E -E it means in a quandary. A quandary is when you don't have any way out. It's like walking through a maze and no one has made an exit at the other end. You walk through this maze and you come up to a brick wall. You walk over here and you go down to another and there are no exits. We have no exits out of the problems that God's going to bring on the earth. And I'll let the next phrase here. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Boy, how's that? Are the seas and the waves roaring? We're having the most powerful hurricanes hit the coasts of America. And we had the most uh, powerful disaster killing more people than any natural disaster in the history since we've been recording history happened just recently in this recent tsunami. 
if you go into uh, checking the, the records on these things and checking out the power of these hurricanes, we had four, uh, what's that, or, or two or three category, what were category three hurricanes? Huh? What are they, what's the high category? Five, category five. We had some real powerful hurricanes. Does anybody remember those? Huh? Andrew was a, yeah, it was really powerful. Yeah, they said these are some of the most powerful hurricanes that have come along in history on the coast of America. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. I believe what we're fixing to see. Now, some people say, well, that wasn't the will of God. Somebody said that Pat Robertson went on Hannity and Combs, and Hannity is a Roman Catholic, and Combs is a Roman Catholic, and Pat Robertson is a Roman Catholic. <laughs> he might as well be, because he's tolerating everybody. And they said, he said, well, it's not the question of whether God did this. What can we do to help these people? Pat, you ignoramus, the Bible says that God ordains everything from the beginning, that he's declared the end from the beginning and everything that's not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will not be deprived of any of my pleasure. Now, let me ask you this. When those plates moved on the bottom of the ocean due to a, uh, due to a, a volcanic eruption below the ocean, and those plates moved... If that wasn't God's will, whose will was it? Was it Fred Johnson's will? And he lives in Bayonne, New Jersey. Is that whose will it was? Or was it John Smith's will, who lives somewhere out in California in Fresno? Well, if it wasn't God's will, I want to know whose will it was. Who was it to set all this thing boiling down there at the temperatures and caused all of these uh, cause whatever kind of combustion is going on down there in the middle of the earth. Who put that there to be flaming like it is right now? And who set these particular pressures so it'll have the kind of temperature it's got? If it wasn't God. Is that insane? And they're saying, well, it wasn't God that did it. Be people who say that. It was somebody's will that did it. Well, that was just the nature. Yeah, like nature has a will on its own. Well, good. Well, they, they're talking. I don't know if some of you saw the, uh, the special last night on Discovery Channel, but they've, they're talking about the largest tsunami that they're expecting to hit will be caused by a volcano that collapses into the ocean off the Canary Islands, uh, off of the coast of North Africa, and that when it collapses, it's going to cause the largest tidal wave ever, and it's going to hit the East Coast from New York all the way to Miami, and it's going to have 1,000-foot tidal waves. Now, you think it will destroy every city from New York to Miami. Now, do you think God won't do that? People say, well, God wouldn't do that. He wouldn't hurt all these innocent people. No one is innocent. I like what Elihu, uh, what uh, Eliphaz said to Job. Whoever perished being innocent. Nobody's perishing being innocent. No one is innocent. Amazes me. I just wanted to bring that out. Now I go back to the 11th chapter. I'm bringing out the 11th chapter of Isaiah, and I'm bringing out how this is a sister chapter. How this is a sister chapter to, to uh, the 37th chapter of Ezekiel. I'm just going to read on down through this. Hold on a second here. Let me flip over here in my old Bible. Sometimes I got notes in my old Bible that I have to remind myself of. Oh, yeah, I've got more notes in my old Bible than I got my new one. All right, now. All right. And we're talking about Christ the branch in the first verse. He's a branch from the stem of Jesse. He'll, he will judge with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding in verse 2. He'll, he will not judge after the sight of the eyes. He will not 
judge by respecting persons, neither reprove after the hearing of the ears. He'll smite the earth with the rod of his mouth in verse 4. And then we talked about from verse 6 down through verse 9 is not talking about a millennial kingdom after this over with. The wolf, the leopard, the young lion, the bear, the lion, uh, these are all, and the asp, these are pictures of evil men or the world empire. When you see the lion, that's a picture, that's a picture of the beast. The Babylon was depicted as the lion. Persia was depicted as the bear. Uh, 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 Greece was depicted as the leopard. And Rome was a composite of these three. Now, I'm going to read on down through here because I want you to see down here at the end of this chapter how that this is a picture, the same kind of picture as the 37th chapter of, e of Ezekiel when God says he'll bring both nations into one. Well, let's continue reading. Speaking of these evil men, they shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. Of course, we know that a mountain was a capital city and God's holy mountain is Zion where the temple sits. And he's talking about Zion being the church because we are heavenly Jerusalem, Mount Zion. We are heavenly Jerusalem, the church of the firstborn. This is a reference in Isaiah to the Gentile church during the last 2,000 years. That's what it's a reference to. We've already gone through a bunch of that. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that covers the sea. And that's a direct allusion to the Gentile church because God's word will no longer be limited to the boundaries of this little kingdom called Israel. It'll be all over the world. The knowledge of God will go all over the world. And when was it extended to the world? Acts 2, where the Lord pours out of his spirit and the Holy Spirit is the truth, and thy word is truth, upon all flesh, the red, yellow, white, black, and brown flesh, to all the world. So this is talking about, and when you take the book of Isaiah, and you look up the word Gentile, and how many times that uh, the Bible speaks of the Gentiles coming to the light, and how that God's going to bless the Gentiles with the light. Let's continue reading here. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign. I like that word, ensign. Uh, it has the same meaning. It's the word ness. Any C? Any C? It's pronounced ness. There'll be an ensign. It means a flag. A flag, a token, a signal. It has the same meaning as the word token in the Old Testament. That is the word O-W-T-H. When the Lord tells Abraham, when he says, you will, I'll be your God, you'll be my people there in Genesis, the 17th chapter. I'm going to give you the land, and you will give me a token in return. And that token, oath, that token will be circumcision. Let me show you what this is, is about. Now, if this is, and it is, the times of the Gentiles being a church. There's two different identifications of times of the Gentiles. There's a time of the Gentiles ruling over the Jews from 586 until the Six-Day War of June 67. 67. And then there is a time period from Jesus... Jesus to the end of time, and that's the time of the Gentile elect church. Church. Now, if you'll notice, in the Old Testament, circumcision is the same. That's the token of, that was given to Abraham. Circumcision. Well, there'll be a signal 
or a token. What is the New Testament word for that? Simeon, S-E-M-E-I-O-N. I want you to notice something. Let me say this slow. He says, at this time, in that day, what day? When they'll not hurt in my holy mountain. The holy mountain of God, during the time of the church, is the church. A mountain is a capital city. We are heavenly Jerusalem. The church, aren't we? Hebrews 12, 22. So during this time period of the church, for the last 2,000 years, are y'all getting this right here? During this time period, if anybody walked in on this, they would say, I'm talking through my hat. But because y'all have already gone through this previously with me, I'm not going to try to cover a lot of this again. You know that from the from that uh, sixth verse down to the ninth verse is talking about the time period of the New Testament church, don't you? I want to show you something here. And you have to really pay close attention when you hit this. During this time period of the Gentile church is what he's saying. Is that clear to everybody? During the time period of the Gentile church when these evil men and this evil empire will not hurt in God's holy mountain or God's church... During that day, during the last 2,000 years, God will send an ensign. That word ensign is that word nesh. It means a flag or a token. There is an ensign during the time period of the Gentile church. A flag or a token. No. Wait. <laughs> the word flag or token or beacon that's the word simeon it's the common word in the new testament sign now a wicked huh well yeah but let me show you the sign what was the sign in the old testament Circumcision. What is circumcision spiritually? It's cutting off of the foreskin of the heart. It's cutting off sin. It's cutting off sin. Cutting off sin. And that is death. I said I can't get away from this. Death to self, isn't it? Now, let me take you over to Matthew, the 16th chapter. We're talking about a sign during the time of the Gentile church, during that day. Right, isn't that what we're talking about? Well, let's go over here and look at this in Matthew. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Look at Matthew 16. Matthew 16. If you'll notice how this stuff ties together. He's going to send an ensign during the days. Let me read that. Before I read this in Matthew 16, do you have you, are you holding your place in Isaiah 11? Well, just look back over at it, and let's read the rest of the verse. In that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign during the days of the church, where is Christ? In our hearts. Isn't he causing the death to self? He's causing the spiritual circumcision. In the Old Testament, the circumcision was the cutting off of self. That's what the token of God was in the Old Testament. Is it the same in the New Sure it is. Let me just read the rest of this. There'll be an ensign. This is really abstract thinking. Just stop and slow down real slow. Which shall be for an ensign of the people. What people is that? The church. The Gentile church. To it shall the Gentiles seek. 
They'll seek the ensign. They'll seek the token. When Christ is in you, that causes death to self, doesn't it? And what comes after death to self? Resurrection. Anastasis. Death to self. A-N-A. S-T-A-S-I-S. I want you to get this verse right here. Anastasis is the resurrection that comes after death to self. Resurrection means to come to life after dying. And our way of dying, come to life after dying. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a picture of death to self. It was the cutting off of sin. That is what circumcision was. When you're talking about circumcision, you're talking about getting rid of self or getting rid of the filth of the flesh. To it the Gentiles shall seek. The Gentiles are going to seek. What Gentiles is this? The elect Gentile church is going to seek this ensign, or the New Testament word would be Simeon. has the same exact definition, or the sign. The Gentile elect church is going to seek this flag, this token. That's what they're going to seek after. Now, throughout the New Testament, you've got the people seeking signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. The Jews seek a sign. Why did the Jews seek signs? Why did they, but why were they seeking signs during the days of Jesus? No. Huh? They got signs in the Old Testament, didn't they? Jeff got it right there. What did they get in the Old Testament? They got a fire by day. A, a cloud by day and a fire by night. A cloud by day. I'll get it in a minute. cloud by day and a fire by night. A cloud by day, fire by night, you said it, Gerald, manna from heaven, what else? Water out of a rock, these are all signs to them, out of a rock, the shoes didn't wear out. Forty years in the wilderness, not one pair of shoes wore out. Deuteronomy 8. Not one pair of shoes, one pair of sandals didn't wear out. What else concerning the shoes? Their feet didn't swell up in 120 degree, 25 degree heat out in the desert. Feet didn't swell up. Huh? Yeah, the quail, boy, they got, did they ever get that? Till it came out their nostrils. Quail. Snakes. Well, you talk about signs. Whip their enemies when they didn't even have armies. That's all they got was signs. Didn't they? So whenever you read this in the New Testament, look at first. Look at first Corinthians. Then we'll go back over here. I'm going to go there in a minute. Look at 1 Corinthians, and then I'm going to come back to Matthew 16. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. <clears throat> All right. Let's start reading here. Verse 19. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise... And will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where are your smart men? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, a simeon. But what is it 
the, what is it the Gentile church is going to seek after? The ensign of God, the sign, aren't they? And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. What? Well, I'm going to finish it. Wait a minute. I'm not through. <laughs> Go over to Mark. Go to Matthew, the 16th chapter. What chapter was that? The Jews seek a sign. That was the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Go over here to... Go to Matthew, the, the 16th chapter. The Pharisees, verse 1, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a simeon. The same thing as the Old Testament has the same exact definition as the word. It's the word simeon has the same definition as ness, has the same definition definition as the word token. Token is this word oath. Oath. Ness is the word there in the 11th chapter of Isaiah. So Ness, Oath, Simeon have the exact same meanings. Huh? Well, the word ensign is the word Ness. It is the word Ness. It means a token, a flag. What is a flag? What is a beacon? It's the same thing we call a sign. It's a, it's a warning. It's, a, it's something to, to tell you what's going on. I, I've said this so many times. If you see this, if you see this. And you drive up to that, and it says, ding, 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 ding. What's that? What is that? That's a sign that a train is coming. Stop. Signs are for a purpose, aren't they? This is the same meaning as our word sign. We got a sign out here that says Grace and Truth Ministries. What does that mean? Yeah, warning. <laughs> That's a sign to warn the warn false teachers and, and liars to stay away. But it's a sign that tells the truth believers, this is the place you're looking for, isn't it? If you want to buy paint, you don't go down the street looking for a McDonald's, do you? No. And when you see those signs out there, that tells you where something is. Now, let's go back to that. Let's go back to that... Uh, now, the Jews seek a sign because that's what they got in the Old Testament. And they gave God a sign in the Old Testament. But guess what? The sign hasn't changed. He answered and said unto them, You're a bunch of hypocrites. You want a sign from me? First of all, they knew the 69th week of Daniel was up. They knew that. They knew the history of the 70 weeks of Daniel. They knew that the Messiah was walking around on the earth somewhere. These are Pharisees, the keepers of the law. They understood the book of Daniel. They knew that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem in 444 B.C., and they knew the history of Nehemiah like the back of their hand. And the Sadducees knew all about it, and they're saying, give us a sign. And he said, when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. I lived in Denver back in 1959. You could tell when it was going to snow. The sky got, the sky got blood red. And the next morning, the, the, just the clouds just broke up. You could tell it. And what he's telling these hypocrites, you seek a sign from me like you've, always, like you've always sought since the beginning of Israel, and you've never believed, and you've lied, and you've changed the Word of God? Oh, you hypocrites. You can discern the face of the sky, but why is it you cannot discern the Simeon? 
of the times. He says, your signs are over with. During the time of the church, I've got one sign left. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall no Simeon be given it, but the Simeon of the prophet Jonah. What was the Simeon of Jonah? He repented and preached. Repentance. He was resurrected from the belly of the fish. It is resurrection, isn't it? Jesus is saying, all the signs, you can forget these. They don't get these anymore. They've never believed them up to the days of Jesus. Why should he keep giving them to them? What is this ensign that's going to be given during the Gentile church? What is the ensign that people will seek after? Yes, it's Jesus, but it's Christ living in us that causes us to die to the flesh and bear our cross. This is actually pointing to the cross that we preached about this morning. So it's an ensign for us during the times of the Gentile church, the Gentile elect will seek to the sign of the resurrection, won't they? Remember the word resurrection is feminine gender when you find it translated anastasis. And that doesn't mean the resurrection of Jesus from a tomb. Was he raised? Yes, he was. But resurrection is to come to life after dying and when we come to life, that's resurrection after we take our cross and die. And that's the sign that the Gentile church is going to seek. And you know how you see this resurrection? You see it in others. When you're new in the truth, and you're looking for these truths, and you've been running around a bunch of free will churches, and you come to a place and you start seeing people practicing the truth, you're going, that's what I want to be. <coughs> I want that truth that causes me to die to self. This is the ensign that the Gentiles are going to be seeking after. Let me give you another verse here. He said, the only sign will be given to you. Go over here. Go over here in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. I don't have time to go through this chapter, but look at verse 21. In the law it is written. This is a reference to the 28th chapter of Isaiah. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. That's a reference to God preaching to the Jews. In fact, you can look at that, uh, Isaiah 28. Go to Isaiah 28 real quick. Isaiah 28. <clears throat> and let me just kind of... Uh, he's talking about here in Isaiah 28. It's awful hard to just get to one verse and not go a lot of places with it. He's talking about in chapter 28. This is around uh, 725 B.C., right before northern Israel goes into captivity. Uh, this is hundreds and hundreds of years after the death of Ephraim, the second-born son of Joseph. Ephraim is living back over in... He's born over in the book of Genesis. Well, this is in Isaiah we're talking about uh, long before this. We're talking about long before, uh, uh, long before this came about. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. What is Ephraim? Northern. Northern Israel. That's right. And he's talking about how they get drunk on false doctrine. And you go down here in uh, verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. 
the table of the Lord was the altar that sat right in front of the gate, the east gate of the temple. That's, that's what the altar was called, where they killed all the sacrifices. So there is no place clean. They were offering bad sacrifices, according to Malachi, the first chapter, crippled lambs, lambs with spots and blemishes. Whom shall he teach knowledge? Who is God going to teach knowledge when he calls this great judgment against Israel? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept. Now, this is not talking about precept ministries. Let's talk a little bit about the truth here and a little bit about the truth there. Watch what he says he's going to do. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. He's not talking about sitting down in a class with some tables and taking notes. For with stammering lips... This is, the, this is quoted, requoted in the 21st verse, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Now the way he's going to teach Israel is to speak to them. But the word stammering, it's an interesting word. It's the word laeg, L-A-E-G. Yeah. To stammer, the, the Hebrew language is a derivative of the Assyrian language. That's why when you look in the back of your concordance and you look in the Hebrew dictionary, it says at the top of the page, Hebrew Chaldee Dictionary. You notice that? The Chaldeans and the Assyrians were identified with one another. The Chaldeans were the magicians of Babylon, and the Hebrews' language was an old ancient Assyrian language. They got their language from the Assyrians. So when the Assyrian war chariots come in, which is just shortly after this is written, and they're whipping the Israelites, cutting them down, it sounded like they were speak. God said, I'm going to preach to Israel here a little with the whips of the Assyrian war chariots. They're not going to be sitting at tables taking notes. They're going to be running for their lives. And God said, I have sent sword, famine, pestilence, sword, famine, pestilence, these first three judgments over and over. Now I'm going to send the beast to crush you to the ground. I'll teach you. You'll listen to my belt. You ever had to tell your kids that? You'll listen to this. And that's what God's saying here. Later on in this chapter, this is called an overflowing scourge. With men of other lips, of stammering lips, the Assyrian war chats and another tongue, while I speak unto this people, to whom he said, this is the rest, wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not here. God is saying they wouldn't hear anything I'm saying. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. Isn't it amazing? The Pentecostals will preach on this and they'll never go back to the 28th chapter. This ain't talking about No, no, no. This is a Syrian war church popping their whips, cutting them down. Those sights on the side, those chariot wheels, just ripping the Israelites down. That's what he's talking about. And they're screaming this something that sounds like a stammering Hebrew language as they're whipping the Israelites. That's what this is referring to. It's not Pentecostalism. Isn't that amazing? They'll read this, but they don't go back to the 28th chapter of... I like his words down there. In Isaiah 28, when he says, uh, well, let's just go back there for a minute. Verse 14, wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people, which is in Jerusalem. The reason I've got the Assyrian war chariots coming in is because you've lied. You've gone after Baal in the grove and Molech and Shemosh and Ashtaroth. Because you have said, 
We have made a covenant with death and with hell. Are we in agreement? That's not a future thing. Hell is the word sheol. And the thing that was, the thing that was compared with hell more than anything else was a valley just southeast of Jerusalem called Tophet where they offered their children in the fire to Moloch. And they made a covenant with these fire gods. We made a covenant with hell. <sighs> when the overflowing scourge, boy, I like that, shall pass through Israel. These are the war chariots that's coming in. It shall not come unto us, for we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hid ourselves. That's talking about they made the lies of going after these idol gods, Baal, Grove, Venus, Hercules. How can I get away from this subject? Can I get away from it? Nowhere can you go in the Old Testament and get away from it. The reason God's calling the beast in, that was the fourth judgment. The beast was the world empire, and he's going to destroy Israel. And that's with men of other tongues will I speak unto this people. Now, I get a Pentecostal to preach that. Now, go back over here. The only sign, the only ensign will be the sign of the prophet Jonah during the last days, won't it? Huh? Well, look here. Huh? Back to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. I hadn't finished this. Verse 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, a simeon. Tongues are for a sign. Tongues, glossa. The whole purpose of foreign languages gift given to these apostles, foreign language, which is the word glossa, the whole purpose of these foreign languages was to be able to preach the gospel, which is the resurrection to the Gentile elect church world. In Acts 2. That's right. Well, we've got to go back to Acts 2. Guess what? Before we do, let's read the rest of this. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, a simeon. How many signs do you get now? One. That's the resurrection, isn't it? What does he say over there in Isaiah 11? During the days of the Gentile church, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign or for a sign. What is the root of Jesse that they're going to seek to? Christ, but where is he going to be? In us, and what's he going to cause? He's going to cause the daily cross, self-denial, which is going to bring about the resurrection, which is the only sign during the last 2,000 years. So this verse 10 in Isaiah 11 is talking about tongues, gloss of resurrection, isn't it? So gloss of Gosh, I didn't mean to get in tongues. Wherefore, foreign languages. Now, I believe that the apostles had an, had an ability to go into foreign lands. Every city-state. Let me just read this again to you. Hold on a second. Boy, I didn't mean to get stuck on this verse so long. I forgot preaching it before years ago. And here we are back to it. It really takes a lot of time just getting through that verse. Isn't it amazing? We can spend all day and all night on these verses. And these other guys preach for chapters. Just They hit a verse here, a word here, a word here. And over yonder and say, boy, we covered. Look at all we got. Now, here's the thing. Let me read out of this to you. I read it this morning. Not in church, but to somebody. I forget who it was. The corne, I think it was Brian. The corne. Corne is the word common. They had a common street language in every city state. They had 
literally hundreds of dialects and foreign languages. And at Corinth, Corinth was the very hub of all trade to all the world. It was the, everything else was just spokes going every direction. All these sailors from all over various parts of the world, they had every kind of a dialect running through these streets and what they were doing They were coming into the church at Corinth and some guy speaks Spanish and some guy speaks Germanic and some guy speaks some other language and they're all coming here and say, I think I got something to say. And Paul is saying, look, nobody here can understand you. And Paul said, I speak in glossa more than anybody, but I'd rather speak five words in a language men can understand than 10,000 words in an unknown glossa. They were doing something different here in 1 Corinthians 14 than we're doing over there in Acts 2. These were a bunch of people coming in wanting to sound off in their own gloss of their own foreign languages what they thought they knew. We have a lot of people coming to grace and truth like that. They think, well, this is a little church over here and I see them on TV. I can go over here. I'll break my, take my soapbox with me and my tree stump and it's a place for me to sound off my beliefs. Come in here and I'll run you out. I've done that. It took one big tall guy by the arm and ushered him out the door one night. Come down here at the front, starting a fight after church. It's disgusting. If I don't believe something they say at that goofy big Baptist church up the street, I'm not going to go up there and start a fight with the preacher after church. I'm going to stay away from him. Let me just read this. The Corne. The spread of the Corne. This is a great book. Mystery Religions by Samuel Angus. He tells you all about the mysteries of that region during the first century. They had the Dionysiac religions. They had the Aleutian mysteries. And these are the same mysteries that they base the Masonic Lodge upon. Same mysteries. All right. The spread of the Koine, or common Greek tongue, deserves special mention. Before Alexander's day, Athens had chiseled for herself her dialect into that classic perfection, which is the wonder of students, which he's talking about the Attic Greek. But Greece never had a uniform national language. They didn't have one uniform national language. Each separate city-state had its own patois. That's a, uh, that's a French word, P-A-T-O-I-S. Yeah, dialect. Each one of them had their own different dialect, which in most cases was as distinct from that of its neighbor a couple of leagues distant as are Spanish and Italian. If you went from... If you went from uh, Troas here over to Philippi up here, your dialect was different, would differ as much as Spanish and Italian. Spanish and Italian are both Latin languages. But because you understand one Latin language, it doesn't mean you can go into any city who had it that has a Latin language <coughs> and speak their language, does it? No. Doesn't mean that. Well, in every city state, they had a different dialect of the Corne. The term Hellas, H E L L A S, y'all have heard me mention that, never became a national or linguistic unity. The chief bond of union being a more or less Catholic religion. He's talking about not Roman Catholic, but Catholic in the sense of its true meaning, universal. While there was no uniform language in which Greek could converse with Greek, there was no language. That's why when those people would come back from, for those three different feasts, all the Jews from all over the world, for where they had been scattered, when they came back, they couldn't talk to each other. And for hundreds of years, they had been trying to establish a way of communication because they were Jews from every nation under heaven. While there was no uniform language in Greek which could converse with Greek, it was impossible for Greece to exercise her intellectual leadership. 
They couldn't exercise their leadership because they had no way to communicate language to language, city to city. That was the problem in Acts 2. That's the sign. That's the ensign that will come. It'll be Christ in us, causing us to die to self and resurrect in Christ. And that's the only sign that'll be after Jesus is nailed to the cross, the sign of the prophet Jonah or repentance and resurrection, resurrection and repentance. If a man must learn a dozen Greek dialects, and of course, when they said, how hear we ever man in our own tongue when we were born, the word tongue is D-I-A-L-E-K-T-O-S. It's our word dialect. All these Jews from every nation under heaven were speaking in different dialects. And the, and the gospel was preached... When the dialects were preached, it was so the gospel could be preached. Go into all the world, teach all nations, all things that I've commanded you. Well, how are they going to do that? First of all, these were 11 ignorant fishermen, shepherd, farmers, northern Galileans, a bunch of dirt farmers, a bunch of Amharets, a word in the Hebrew that means men of the soil, common people. All they knew was one dialect of the, and when Matthias was added to them, you got one more, and you got 12 ignorant guys that's going to go into all the world when they can't go from one city to the next. God gave them a miraculous ability to preach, and when they preached, those men would hear in their own dialect wherein they were born. And that's the ensign that men will seek to. The resurrection. When tongues are for a sign, the resurrection has to be preached. I wonder what Peter was preaching in Acts 2. Look here. And if a man must learn a dozen Greek dialects and half a dozen oriental tongues before he could travel and exchange ideas with men of other races, he would prefer to remain at home. It was too hard being a traveling salesman. Lydia was a traveling sales lady. She sold purple, and if you bought purple, it took so many of these mollusks off of the, off of the coast of Tyre, it just took thousands of them to make one purple garment. And so they knew if you owned purple... You had to be rich. If you were poor, caught with a purple coat, they put you in jail. They knew that that only the rich could afford purple. And that was the color of royalty because it was so expensive. That Aramaic, which had for centuries served as the diplomatic language between the powers of the Nile and those of the Euphrates, in Tigris was no longer adequate. And the perfect precision of Attic Greek was as impossible for the ordinary man as it seems now to a schoolboy in his first year. Attic Greek was too hard to learn. What you and I are talking is a dialect like, hey there, you guys, what's going on, y'all? That's what we're studying. It was the common street man's language. Now... Now, let's go back and read that one more time. Gosh, what does it take to get through one verse? One more time, 1 Corinthians 14. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign. We've already established there's only one sign to unbelievers, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Those that believe not get one sign. Resurrection. Isn't that it? But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So when we preach, prophesy doesn't mean to talk about the future only. It's the word prophetia. It means to speak the words of another. What this is talking about, prophesying is preaching the word of God. When you preach the word of God, it is for the enhancement or for the strength of the believer. Now, if tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but them that believe not, what were they preaching at Pentecost? Look at it one more time, Acts 2. I I didn't even mean to come here. 
but I couldn't keep from coming here because of the ensign of Acts 11. How much time do I have? Fifteen. Gosh, I'm trying to explain this. I thought I was going to get back to the colors tonight. I'll see if I can't do that next week. Now, I'll get back to the colors next week on the... I'm sorry, I just I, I take off and it's hard to get everywhere I want to go. Look here in Acts 2. They all were in one accord and they all spoke with other glossa. Verse 4, as the Spirit gave them utterance. That's the word apophathangamai. In verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said... And that word said is the same word, apophathengamai. It's the same word as utterance in verse 4. It means to speak clearly as to be understood. And when Peter lifted up his voice and said, he didn't say some guttural sounds like, Does that kind of the way they sound? Isn't that stupid? Don't you guys feel embarrassed for that? Huh? Too stupid to be embarrassed. Uh? <laughs> I'm pretty good at this. <coughs> this depends on how much you can cluck your tongue. Huh? That's anybody can do it. And what's funny is Bob said this one preacher, he said this same words, Mashula Mashika, and everything was. Yea, I say unto you, the Lord is my God, he is my helper, and I will be unto thee a God, and God shall follow thee, and it's all mustalamusula makashika. Just the same thing, and, it, and the interpretation could go from here to yonder, from the end of the universe. It's the same two or three phrases over and over again. Golly. Peter lifted up his voice, and apophathengamai, he said clearly, not shandalakandai, but ye men of Judea. Is that clear? Got to remember, said and utterance are the same exact words. Apophathengamai, A-P-O-P-H. A-P-O. Didn't know I was going to get into tongues tonight. P-H. T-H-E-G-G-O-M-A-I. The word utterance and the word said in verse 14. Same word. Now, that'll kind of give him something to think about, won't it? <laughs> it's just crazy. So Peter starts preaching here in verse 14, and he's preaching all the way down, and notice what he preaches, and he gets all the way down here. Verse 23, him, speaking of Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. Now, Peter is talking with the eleven to thousands of Jews from every nation under heaven, and they're all hearing in their own dialect when they were born. That's that word dialectos. In verse 8, how hear we ever men in our own dialect when we were born? All right. Verse 24. Remember, tongues are for a sign. And the only sign will be the sign of the prophet Jonah, the resurrection. And during the days of the church, there'll be an ensign given. It will be Christ in us that causes us to preach the truth and die to self. Whom Christ hath raised up. I think he's preaching the resurrection here, isn't he? The only sign to the unbeliever. Having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Now Jesus didn't go to what we call hell. This is the word Hades. Let me tell you something about Hades. This is quoted from the book of Psalms. Let me just give you this real quick. 
Hades and Sheol. To the Jews, they said that Hades, Sheol was the Old Testament word for the same word as Sheol, uh, for Hades. <laughs> Hades, the definition of Hades gives us the best understanding. They said Sheol and Hades was like an umbrella. It was like a covering. It, in, it included all of the dead, righteous, unrighteous, bodies, spirits, bodies, spirits. Our spirit, our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Our bodies are buried in a grave or a tomb, or tomb. The bodies of the unrighteous goes into a grave or a tomb. And to say this correctly, there is a good compartment of Hades. Now, this is Jewish belief. This is what they said. There's a good compartment of Hades, and there is a bad compartment. And the definition of Hades will show you this. The word Hades is the word, it comes from the word Ido. Remember the word Ido? Same word that Paul used when he said, I know whom I have believed. It means to see or perceive. To see, perceive. I didn't make this up. I know people are like, you're making that up. I got all of this right here. I was going to talk about hell. The state that we call death, this is out of Girdle Stones. Uh, the state that we call death, the condition consequent on the act of dying is to be viewed in three aspects. First, there's the tomb or sepulcher the local habitation of the physical frame called Kiber. Secondly, there is the corruption whereby the body itself is dissolved. Thirdly, there is Sheol, which represents the locality or condition of the departed. The authorized version translates Sheol by the words hell, the grave, the pit. When the Bible says, Behold, I'll show you mystery, we'll not all sleep, we'll all be changed in the moment of the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For uh, when this mortal hath been put on immortality, and when, this, uh, when, this, when we put on this immortality, when he says, when he goes on to say there in 1 Corinthians 15, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? The word grave there is the word Hades. Hades. When you place the alpha privative in front of a word, it negates the word and gives an opposite meaning. When you place the alpha in front of ido, what would that mean? What it means... It means a place of the unseen. Can you see the bodies they called a grave Hades? Well, that's what they called it, Gerald. Oh, okay. They called a grave Hades. Oh, you can't, you can't see the bodies in a grave, can you? You can't see the bodies in a tomb. The bo where the bodies was was called Hades or a place you could not see them. When you place the alpha primitive in front of of Ido, it translates Hades. Can you see that? We can't see the spirits that go be with the Lord, can we? And we can't see the spirits that go to this hot place that we call hell. Where they got the word hell, <coughs> that was an Irish term. <coughs> it's a bad translation. But the, actually, the Irish term, 
helps us to understand better, the word hell doesn't mean some hot place. To the Irish, hell was a long, deep trench where they buried their potatoes so they would rot. So if you, go, if you went to Ireland, and you talked about hell, some guy said, oh, you're talking about my potatoes out here? As quick as he would think in some hot place. He wouldn't think of a hot place if he's a true Irishman. So you can't see the bodies of the righteous. You can't see the spirits of the righteous. You can't see the bodies. So they use this word Hades or Sheol like a covering to include all of this. Let me see if I got something else here. Sheol in the Old Testament, Hades in the New. Uh, Genesis 37 and 35. I will go down to the grave. That's the word Sheol. The Lord kills, he makes alive in 1 Samuel 2 and 6. He bringeth down to the grave. That's the word Sheol. It's the same meaning. And bringeth up. The word hell stands for Sheol. Uh, a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. That's the word Sheol. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Let me see here. All right. Thou shalt not consign my soul to Hades. Thou shalt not leave my body in the grave. And he quotes this. This is a translation by a Hebrew Greek scholar, a man named Girdlestone. And he goes through all of this. And then I've got one here by... Let me read this to you. This is out of the uh, Talmud and Hebraic of books by Lightfoot. Listen to what he says. The state, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. Talking about this verse in Acts 2. Let me read this to you. Not leave my soul in hell. It is well known what the word Hades signifies in Greek authors. The state of the dead, be they just or unjust. The state of the dead, Mr. Lightfoot tells us. And their eternal state is distinguished not so much by the word itself as by the qualities of the persons, whether they're believers or not. All the just, the heroes, the followers of religion and virtue, according to those authors, are in Hades. But it is in Elysian, the Elysian fields, that was a paradise. So they're in the, the Elysian fields of paradise. That's us when we die. In joy and felicity, all the evil, the wicked, the unjust, they are in Hades too. But then that is in hell, in torture and punishment, so that the word Hades is not used in opposition to heaven or the state of the blessed. It's not just in opposition to the state of the blessed, because we are in a place of the unseen as well. But to this world only, or this present state of life, which, be, which might be out of, which might be made out of numberless instances in those authors. The soul of our Savior, therefore, descended into hell, but not into the hot place. He passed into the state of the dead, and his body was not seen in the tomb. They put a seal upon it, didn't they? And he was not seen. He ascended to the Father. He resurrected in three days unto that place in Hades where the souls of good men went. But even there did not God suffer his soul to abide separate from his body, nor his body to putrefy in the grave. That's the idea that Peter's saying here, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, in the grave. I'm going to resurrect. He's preaching the resurrection when he says that. Can you see that? Because it was impossible for Christ to be holden of those bands of death. He was saying Jesus was not left in the grave. Not he wasn't. These Pentecostal charismatics that say Jesus went down to hell and preached to, those, to the dead for three days. That's stupid. 
Jesus did not go down into hell. Preaching to people that have no opportunity? Pat Robertson's people have said, they said one time, well, I love to, for them to ask him a question like that. One guy in the audience said, Brother Pat, did Jesus go down and preach to the spirits in prison in hell? That's not the spirits in prison. The spirits in prison, the Gentiles. And Pat Robertson broke out in a cold sweat. <sighs> Boy, they don't like to be asked that question. He's going, oh, oh. yes, Jesus went down to hell and preached to them for three days and, and invited everyone out in the Old Testament that hadn't accepted him yet. Yeah, and some of them said, no, we like it in South Hell. We're getting a good tan down here. <laughs> you stupid jerk. Nobody would be in hell. That would include Nimrod and Ahab and Athaliah and Jezebel. Stupid and dumb. But they don't know what hell means. Because it was impossible for Christ to be holding to the bands of death, seeing his death was not some punishment of sin, but the utmost pitch of obedience, he himself being not only without sin, but incapable of committing many. So when Peter is preaching this, he said God didn't leave his soul in the grave. He resurrected him. He's preaching the resurrection, the only Simeon, the only ensign that the Gentile church is going to seek. Can we see that? Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. You have to understand what they believed about corruption. They believed that the, that the Spirit would hover around a grave for four days. And they didn't believe the person was completely dead until he'd been dead for four days. That's why they said he swooned. How many days was Lazarus dead? Lazarus was dead for four days. That's why I said Lazarus is dead. Let me assure you he's dead. Now watch me with the resurrection. In chapter 2 of Acts, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. By the way, that's quoted from Psalm 16 and 10. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Thou shalt make me full of the joy of of thy countenance, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit at the throne. He, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ. What's Peter preaching here when he's preaching in the dialects and the glossa? Resurrection. What's the only sign to the unbeliever? Resurrection. That his soul was not left in hell. He explains it in verse 31 of chapter 2 of Acts. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in the grave, neither his flesh did see corruption. Let's go back over to Isaiah 11 and read that verse again. Sometimes I like to go read a verse after I've explained it. So do you realize how much that he's talking about here? I'll work my way back to Revelation uh, 21st chapter. Y'all have to excuse me. I'm, I just have to finish this chapter. Look here. Look here. Do I have any time? One minute. Look here real quick. Now, do you see that from verse 6 down through 9, that's they will not hurt in my church anymore? And in that day, when the church is here for a 2,000-year period, there shall be a root of Jesse, Christ. It'll be in us, which shall be for a sign. And the only sign during that time period will be the resurrection, and it will be in us daily because we're dying daily. And all of the Gentile elect will be seeking that resurrection, won't we? It'll be Christ in you. which shall stand for an ensign of the people to this sign shall the Gentiles seek. It's not talking about all the Gentiles in the world, just the Gentile church. Can y'all see this? Do y'all see what we're talking about here? But you have to understand that this is not a millennium where the wolf and the leopard, this is the time period 
of the Gentile church. And we're seeking a sign, and it's Christ in a man. And when we see each other, when a new person comes into contact with the truth, and they see somebody dying daily and Christ resurrecting, that's the sign to the unbeliever. Do you know that's what you preach to unbelievers with more than anything else is your lifestyle and the way you live when you're dying daily and you're resurrecting in Christ. It makes baby believers want to be that way. They seek that. Whew, I'm out of time, ain't I? Let me just read verse 11. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. I think that's happened, hasn't it? And he's recovering the remnant of his elect. I don't have time to go through the rest of this. Mm. Took me the whole message to get through verse 10. Uh, I've got a lot on hell up here just in these papers. People don't know what this is about. I like this, what they say in, this is Adam Clinic and Strong, Hades. A Greek word derived according to the best established and most generally received etymology from privative A in Ido. They say it. And Ido, hence often written, Aides, means strictly what is out of sight or possibly if applied to a person what puts out of sight that's the word the word we use is hell men say go to hell he may be saying go out of my sight can you see that hell don't eat isn't it amazing even hell don't mean what we think does it let's pray Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for showing us these, these truths that you've just, you seem to covered it over and hidden it from the wise and prudent, but you let our eyes see through this veil, this covering, you remove it. Thank you for the ability to see, to hear. Cause us to continue the work. Lord, give especially me and Mary the strength to continue your work. And God will give you praise, glorify you. In